Oh. All right. Um. Yeah, this is the tragic death of John Bonham. This is this was actually requested a while ago, but I didn't get around to doing that as as well as Town Van Sands. But I just did Town Van Sands story. Jesus, that was that was tragic for real and. So I thought, seeing as I just did one tragic story, I might as well, yeah, take this kind of mood I'm in from the Town Fan Sands thing to do John Bonham's tragic death of John Bonham. But yeah, let's go. As the drummer of Led Zeppelin, John Bonham became best known for his versatility and is regarded as one of the greatest drummers in rock history. At Led Zeppelin's peak in the early to mid 70s, Bonham would enhance the band's live shows with epic long form drum solos, but the enormous pressures and expectations from fame would cost him his life. Bonham would die at 32 years old in 1980, just one year following the release of the group's eighth album. Today, let's explore the life and death of Led Zeppelin's drummer, John Bonham. <clears throat> John Bonham would be born on May 31st, 1948 in Redditch, England, and was the eldest of three children. He would have a brother named Mick and a sister named Deborah. His father would run a construction company and employ his children with John working as a bricklayer. In fact, his time as a bricklayer would help him develop hard palms that would allow him to play the drums with his hands. Apart from working for his father, Bonham would also take a liking to music, making his first makeshift drum kit with a bath salt container as a snare drum. Music would become an important asset to Bonham's life starting at age five, and he would take a cue from American jazz drummers. Bonham's younger sister, Deborah, recalled her brother's early efforts in the radio documentary, The John Bonham Story, saying, John got his influence from Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich because our mom and dad used to play them all the time. They loved Glenn Miller, Harry James, and Frank Sinatra. That's what he used to play in the shed, she'd say. Once Bonham turned 10, his mother, Joan, bought him a snare drum, and at age 15, his father, Jack, bought him his first proper drum kit. It was during this time that the young drummer would befriend another drummer who lived nearby named Gary Alcock. Gary had played in both big bands and played jazz music and recalled giving Bonham some rudimentary lessons recalling, I never taught him any classes as such, I didn't teach him at all, but we would sit in the front room with sticks and a practice pad and I would show him a few things. It was just a case of, do you know this one? I remember him playing one of my snare drums and me saying, for God's sake, John, hold on. I thought he was going to hit through it so hard, he'd recall. <laughs> Although Bonham's musical foundation was based in jazz, rock and roll allowed him to branch out, and it would be Sandy Nelson's 1959 hit Teen Beat that catalyzed his ambitions for being in a band. Bonham, according to Classic Rock Magazine, would state, and I quote, Drumming was the only thing I was any good at, so I stuck at it. I always worked hard all the time. When I was 16, I went into full-time music, but I have to go back to building sites to earn money to live. There were no gigs, there was no money, he'd recall. By the early 60s, Bonham would attend Lodge Farm Secondary Modern School, and he'd develop a self-taught approach as a musician and became more competent, and he would receive guidance from other bands in the local beat scene. Bonham would become known for his hard style of playing, or thunder. Of course, it would result in a lot of broken drum heads. In fact, this heavy style of playing would sometimes result in him being banned from many venues, as these <laughs> locations would have a volume limit that would automatically shut off the power if the sound exceeded that threshold. The Thanks, Reddish bro. Youth Club would become one of the drummer's popular hangouts, and he'd befriend and join various bands, including Jerry Levine and the Avengers and Blue Star Trio. He would find more opportunities in neighboring Birmingham, eventually reconvening with fellow Blue Star Trio bandmate Terry Beale. In 1963, the two were involved in Terry Webb and the Spiders, and later the Senators. Senators bassist Bill Ford spoke to Brumbeat.net about Bonham's integration into the band, saying, our drummer let us down again one night when we had a double gig. Terry played drums on the first set at the first gig at Perry Hall. During the break, he shot off in his car to fetch his mate, who said he could play drums. He came back 20 minutes later with this lad named John Bonham. We started the second half, and it was as if someone had stuck rocket fuel in our drinks. We went down a storm, and John joined us as a drummer there and then. With Bonham in tow, the band would release a single, a cover of She's a Mod in 1964, which had become a hit for the New Zealand band Ray Columbus and the Invaders. The following year, Bonham would marry his girlfriend, Pat Phillips, with whom he'd have two children with, one of which Jason would follow in his father's footsteps. 
It was during this time he joined another band named A Way of Life, a group he recorded a few demos with. It was on these demos that Bonham was told that he played too loudly and that his takes couldn't be recorded. It would be ironic considering Bonham would later become known for his hard-hitting style. According to Classic Rock Magazine, years later when Led Zeppelin would have a lot of success, Bonham would send the manager of Way of Life one of his gold discs with a note that said, thanks for your advice. A Way of Life <laughs> would take a temporary break and Bonham would become involved with the blues band The Crawling King Snakes, which would feature future Led Zeppelin frontman Robert Plant. Plant, who was only 16 at the time, remembered feeling intimidated by Bonham's presence at first, but was also taken aback by him recalling, I was singing at the Plaza Ballroom in Old Hill, there was a guy with quite an arrogant air to himself, very cocky, standing watching me. He came up to me after the show. He said, you're pretty good, but you'll be a lot better if you had a drummer like me. I thought, nobody says that sort of thing to me. Don't they know who I might end up one day being? That was the first time we ever communicated at all. And it was the beginning of a fantastic exchange of energies between us over the years, he'd say. In 1967, A Way of Life would reassemble. It was during this time that Bonham still kept in touch with Plant, who would put together another group named Band of Joy. And although they only managed to record several demos together, they'd remain a steady live act. By 1968, Band of Joy opened for Tim Rose, an American singer-songwriter who found substantial success in England, and after several months, Bonham became the band's drummer. It was at one of these gigs that another drummer, Phil Collins, witnessed Bonham playing, recalling to Classic Rock Magazine. Within the first few minutes, I was dumbstruck by the drummer. He was doing things with his bass drum that I'd never seen or heard before. He then played a solo, and again, I'd never heard or seen a drummer play like that. He played with his hands on the drums, later found out that as a bricklayer, he had very hard hands. It was obvious from seeing him solo that night. I vowed to keep an eye on this guy Bonham, and I followed his progress. He was even then a major influence on my playing, he'd recall. Meanwhile, in London, guitarist Jimmy Page, who was impressed by the work of a session musician named Terry Reed, had overseen the breakup of his own band, The Yardbirds. Page wanted Reed to sing on his new project that he was forming, which he called the New Yardbirds, but since Reed was unavailable, the vocalist would suggest Robert Plant to fill the role. With Plant fronting the project, Page recruited bassist John Paul Jones from his time as a session musician and had several potential drummers in mind to round out the lineup. Plant would recommend John Bonham, and Page was initially uncertain about Plant's choice, but after seeing Band of Joy perform with Tim Rose at a local club, both he and Peter Grant, who would become the band's manager, were sold. It would take some time before Bonham decided to join the New Yardbirds, as he had received offers from other bigger acts, namely Joe Cocker, who offered him a lot more money. But the members of the New Yardbirds pestered Bonham with telegrams that would be sent to his favorite pub. By this point in time, he'd become one of the most sought-after drummers in and around Redditch, and Bonham would end up joining the New Yardbirds, having preferred their style of music. John Paul Jones would recall to Classic Rock Magazine meeting Bonham for the first time, stating, The first time I ever met John was in the tiny basement room we had rented in Lyle Street. We just had loads of amps and speaker cabs there that had been begged, borrowed, or stolen. The first thing that struck me about Bonzo was his confidence. And you know, he was a real cocky bugger in those days. Still, you have to be able to play like that. It was great instant concentration. He wasn't showing off, but was just aware of what he could do. He was rock solid. That's not to say that the band got off to a smooth start with Bonham. At his first rehearsal with the band, his bandmates complained that he was all over the place and too busy, with Paige telling him to, and I quote, keep it simple, according to Classic Rock. In fact, the publication would document one instance in which manager Peter Grant asked the drummer, do you like your job in the band? To which he nodded. Well, do as this man says, behave yourself, or you'll disappear through different doors, he'd say. The New Yardbirds would debut on September 16, 1968, performing in Copenhagen, Denmark, as part of a week-long tour of Scandinavia, with a repertoire of Yardbird hits, as well as several originals. By October, the band went on to record their debut album in preparation for their first UK tour. The album would be recorded and mixed in only nine days, and was financed by both Page and Grant, costing less than £2,000 to complete. But it would also be released under a new moniker, after the band received a cease and desist letter from one of Page's old bandmates. It said that some of the names the band thought of were the Mad Dogs and Whoopee Cushion, before ultimately settling on the name Led Zeppelin, which was brought up on the fly by drummer Keith Moon of The Who. Page would tell Ultimate Guitar in 2018, it was a name that Keith Moon had mentioned back then. He was talking, wouldn't it be fun to have a band called Led Zeppelin? And I asked him if we could use the name. So when we were playing in Scandinavia, we were out there as the New Yardbirds. It was a cloak of invisibility, really. And even on the first recordings, it said New Yardbirds on the box because I didn't want anybody to know the name of the band. 
until we really officially unveiled it and the first album was it, he'd recall. <coughs> Led Zeppelin's self-titled debut album would be released in the U.S. in January of 1969 on major label Atlantic Records, with Jimmy Page primarily in charge of arrangements and production, while Robert Plant handled lyrical duties. The band would release Good Times, Bad Times as a single in March of that year, and while the album consisted of originals as well as rocked-up renditions of blues standards, as a whole, the album utilized a groundbreaking heavy blues rock style, definitive of Led Zeppelin's artistic identity. Journalist Chris Welch, who wrote for Melody Maker at the time, would recall his first time hearing the album prior to its release telling Louder Sound in 2014. One of the younger writers brought an early pre-release copy of the album in and played it on the office stereo and it just leapt out at you. It really did feel like a great leap forward in terms of sound that you could actually get on a record. And that was just the first track. It would be vanilla fudge drummer Carmine Apice, who toured with Led Zeppelin during their North America debut a month prior, who would become fast friends with Bonham and was surprised to know that he was a big influence on the drummer's signature technique. Apice would tell Blabbermouth in 2021, on the very first gig they played with us, I said to John, I love your foot on the record, it's unbelievable. And he said, thanks, I got it from you. I said, you did? I don't remember doing that. And he said, yeah, it's right on your vanilla fudge record. Where is that? Because in those days and still today, I don't play what I rehearse. I play whatever comes to me when I'm doing it. I had done it somewhere on a record, so he pointed it out. I think it was on the Renaissance record, he'd say. Led Zeppelin's debut record was immediately successful, reaching the top 10 in both the US and the UK, and charting highly throughout Europe. The band's follow-up album, Led Zeppelin II, would be released the same year in October, but received some pushback at first, but it would eventually prove to be even more successful reaching number one in both the US and the UK and giving the band their first gold certification on the strength of the lead single, Whole Lot of Love. Mm. While the band's chemistry continued to be a solid factor in the album's success, another factor of note was Bonham's increased presence as a drummer. Bonham's experience he'd gained from long intensive live sets led to the album's instrumental track, Moby Dick, where he showcases a drum solo that utilized his distinctive hand foot triplet technique. By the 70s, Led Zeppelin would sustain platinum status with each album that followed, as well as achieve other significant milestones. They developed their touring presence internationally and were highly influenced in shaping the musical climate of the decade. The release of 1970's Led Zeppelin III and the 1971 Untitled album, commonly referred to as Led Zeppelin IV, not only catalyzed their continued success, but demonstrated considerable artistic growth. While Bonham loved playing live shows, it was a downtime between gigs, and the act of physically flying from city to city that he hated. In fact, flying made the drummer physically sick. He killed time by drinking ahead of gigs and Bonham would admit to suffering from panic attacks. Bev Bevan of ELO would tell Classic Rock Magazine, he was an extrovert, a friendly, huggable bloke, but unfortunately the drink just got too much for him. He overdid it and could become quite aggressive. He was similar to Keith Moon. They felt they had to live up to their reputations, he'd say. Following the release of 1973's Houses of the Holy, Led Zeppelin began work on their concert film The Song Remains the Same, named after the album's opening track, which would use footage from three sold-out shows at New York's Madison Square Garden. The following year, the band made the leap from Atlantic to their own independent label, Swan Song Records, which housed their primary releases and solo material, as well as signed up-and-coming artists at the time, including Bad Company. In addition, Page and Plant's new home-based studios would allow for smoother workflow, as well as diverse experimentation, which would be exemplified on the band's 1975 double album, Physical Graffiti. At the time of the album's release, Britain's income taxes were some of the highest by global standards, which prompted the band to spend the year touring exclusively abroad, a move which angered some of their fan base back home. Interestingly, the release of Physical Graffiti led to all of Led Zeppelin's previous records re-entering the Billboard Hot 200 charts, and as a result, the band went on another tour of America. At this point in their career, the band also expanded upon their live act, which included bigger, more flamboyant stage shows, and Bonham's drum solos became a huge draw, with many surpassing the 20-minute mark. After playing a sold-out five-show stint at the Earl's Court in London, the band would take a break and planned on resumed touring in the fall. By June 10th of 1975, Bonham's daughter Zoe would be born, but with these triumphs came uncertainty and a series of further complications that would cause Led Zeppelin to lose some momentum. Two months later, while Robert Plant and his wife Maureen were vacationing in Greece, both were involved in a serious car wreck. Plant would break his leg and was briefly contained to a wheelchair, not being able to walk for six months. He was flown back home to the UK for treatment, unable to be by his wife's side during her recovery, when she'd be saved by a successful blood transfusion. The band would extend their hiatus and went to Jersey and the Channel Islands before going to Malibu in California, 
to write their follow-up album Presence. The band then flew to Munich, Germany to record the record, which took a little more than two weeks, and despite their return to a denser, more cohesive blues rock sound, the band's chemistry seemed hampered. This was largely due to the fact that Page and Plant contributed most of the material. The album would be finally released in March of 1976, and Presence would still manage to go triple platinum, but it was critically panned as well as a disappointment sales-wise, especially when compared to Physical Graffiti, which previously moved about five times as many units and proved to be much more influential. On the other hand though, Jimmy Page considers Presence to be one of his personal favorites, especially while noting their circumstances. He told Guitar World in 1993, it was a reflection of the height of our emotions at the time. There were no acoustic songs, no keyboards, no mellowness. We were also under incredible deadline pressure to finish the record. We did the whole thing in 18 days. I was working an average of 18 to 20 hours a day. It was also grueling because nobody else really came up with song ideas. It was really up to me to come up with all the riffs, which is probably why Presence is so guitar heavy. But I don't blame anybody. We were all kind of down. We just finished the tour and we were non-resident and Robert was in the cast, so I think everybody was a little homesick. Our attitude was summed up in the lyrics on T for One, he'd say. Despite the band's problems during the recording of Presence, their circumstances still remain complicated. Still unable to tour due to Plant's injuries, the band instead focused on releasing their concert film. The song remains the same, which up until this point had been in development for three years. Initially did well with its premiere in the US, but bombed back home amongst UK fans who were still cynical of the group. The next year, although the band was back on tour in North America, tragedy would strike. Plant's five-year-old son would pass away due to complications from a stomach virus, which led to the band canceling the remainder shows of the tour, and he would return home to the UK. On top of this, bassist John Paul Jones struggled to keep the peace in the band, while guitarist Jimmy Page was suffering from a debilitating heroin addiction while bottom bound alcoholism. Despite their struggles, Led Zeppelin's 1979 follow-up, In Through the Outdoor, signaled a strong comeback for the group, as the album not only reached number one in both the US and the UK, but also in Canada, Germany, and Japan. Similar to what happened with Physical Graffiti, the release of the album led to the band's previous records re-entering the Billboard Hot 200 charts. While on tour to support the album though, Adam's addictions were getting the better of him and taking a toll on his body. During a show in Nuremberg, Germany, just three songs into the set, the drummer fell ill and collapsed on stage. Then on September 24th, 1980, Led Zeppelin was preparing for a tour of North America, which would be their first in three years. As mentioned in the book Led Zeppelin, A Celebration, the band's assistant Rex King was ready to drive the drummer to Brace Studios for rehearsals, but once they stopped for breakfast on the way, Bonham drank heavily. He consumed four quadruple vodka screwdrivers, which is about 16 shots altogether. And by the time the two reached the studio, his heavy drinking continued. That evening, the band wrapped up rehearsals and retreated to Jimmy Page's house in Windsor. Bonham would fall asleep by midnight on September 25th, but by the afternoon the following day, both John Paul Jones and the band's tour manager discovered him unresponsive. He was later pronounced dead, and an inquest conducted two days later revealed that in just one day, Bonham suffered a pulmonary aspiration after consuming as many as 40 shots of 80 proof vodka. Following Bonham's passing, Led Zeppelin released a statement on December 4th that read, We wish it to be known that the loss of our dear friend and the deep respect we have for his family, together with a sense of undivided harmony felt by ourselves and our manager, have led us to decide that we cannot continue as we were. The band would break up that year, but would reunite in 1985 to play a set for Live Aid with session drummer Tony Thompson and Genesis drummer Phil Collins. Several more reunion concerts would take place over the years with Bonham's son Jason filling in on drums, with the last one happening in 2007. That same year, the music magazine stylist ranked John Bonham as the number one drummer on their 50 Greatest Drummers list, as did the publication Classic Rock Magazine two years prior. On June 15, 2017, Bonham's sister Deborah would unveil a new <coughs> black outside the house they grew up in on Birchfield Road. The following year on May 18th, which would have been John Bonham's 70th birthday, a bronze graffiti resistance statue sculpted by Mark Richards was unveiled in their hometown in Mercian Square. Bonham's son Jason and his tribute band, Jason Bonham's Led Zeppelin Evening, formed in 2010 and as of 2021 continues to tour and sustain his legacy. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories, take care. Yeah, that was pretty interesting to be fair. I mean, it was really not about his death no, until right at the end. And basically, he just drunk himself to death one day. It, this is such an unlucky band, Led Zeppelin. It really is, for as great as they are musically, I mean... It's like, would you, um...
trade that in to be that good musically to be that fucking unlucky Jesus But yeah, that was a good video, I know, because that was like quite a good sum up of the whole career, really. But yeah, ending with Bonham's death. And it's crazy that he, when he was younger, he was told, um, <laughs> you hit it too hard. He was like, well, fucking hell. He literally became the god of drums, like... People, I see there's two drummers that get are thrown into the bag of greatest drummer, and it's him and Neil Peart. And I'd agree, I think both of them are the same, but most drummers don't actually contribute much. But Neil Peart and John Bonham, their drumming. I'll tell you another one though, people will fucking be like, fuck off, is Ringo. Because you can say what you want, Ringo's drumming is not the great greatest in a usual sense but it's very unique and it gave the Beatles a whole different sound to everybody else and that's kind of what you want um, and it's the same with all with Bonham and Neil Peart Neil Peart has that ability to just change the whole vibe and Bonham does too like Bonham's following the lead guitar instead of the bass is yeah you can just feel it um, well yeah that's crazy no what do you fucking drink 16 16 fucking vodkas before he turned out madness madness And I suppose like he's kind of the only person that Zeppelin is gonna actually have his his son, which I think is kind of good. It's like it can live on through him and the fact that the son gives does Zeppelin Jason Bonham Zeppelin nights, I mean I said to keep his memory going, yeah. And to keep his legacy going. I mean I don't think you'd need to do that. To be honest, because I've never heard of that, and I knew John Bonham before I started doing Zeppelin reaction, so I don't think you that's ne that's necessary because his legend is already there. You don't need to keep it alive. He is, like I say, there's two people: Neil Peart and John Bonham. They're the people that go to people, and that's the pretty much the argument of drummers: who's the better out of them two? And it really is depending on who you're listening to. If you're listening to Led Zeppelin, you'll be like, yeah, fucking Bonham's better. And if you listen to Neil, you listen to Rush, then you'll be like, Neil Peart's better. Because they are fucking great. But the pair of them are just amazing. Um, but yeah, that's the reaction. Sweet.